So, imagine that our entire life is a computer simulation. Yeah, just like the sci-fi movies. What we feel when we touch any object is the response of neurons in the brain. Smell, sight, and all other senses, even emotions, would only be the result of a billion calculations of a massive computer. The most striking, and probably scary thing, is that this theory makes sense. The first video game in the world was created in 1952, Noughts and Crosses. In 1958, the game Tennis for Two was released. It had only two lines and one simple dot, which was considered a tennis ball. Both games were simpler than an electronic calculator, but people were amazed. Now, 62 years later, there are many worlds in modern video games. Worlds that contain characters with artificial intelligence. These characters can interact with each other and with the player. Graphics in games are becoming more realistic every year. Virtual reality glasses allow you to plunge into a new world. If people from 1958 heard this, they would think it was fantasy. Now, imagine what will happen in the next 50 years. Graphics and games could become identical to reality, and characters will behave like real people. They'll perform so many different actions that you can just watch them like a movie. The power of computers will increase by millions of times. They'll be able to generate brain activity inside the artificially created character. All bots will feel a full life and not realize that they are just part of extensive computer simulation and serve to entertain players. When humanity creates such a virtual world and observes the characters inside it, the question arises, are we not now someone else's simulation? The simulation theory is supported in Silicon Valley, and many rich people invest in research of this topic. More people began to believe this theory when people discovered the quantum world. This is a universe of super small objects. Imagine putting a grain of sand under the most powerful microscope in the world. At first, you can clearly see all the grain's contours as if it were a huge stone. Then, you can look even more in depth and see grain structure, the smallest details, compared to which the grain looks like a skyscraper. You look even deeper and see its molecular structure. If you zoom into the maximum, the clarity of what you see becomes blurry. You also find the image consists of granules reminiscent of pixels. It's like watching a 4K TV, but you can see small dots if you get close enough to the screen. All physical objects are made up of molecules. Molecules are made of atoms. There are nuclei inside the atoms. In the nuclei, protons and neutrons fly. Really stupid particles are called morons. Nah, I just made that up. But the particles are so far apart that almost the entire area of the atom is empty. If you increase the nucleus of an atom to a football field size, then the particles flying around will be several miles away from the core. In other words, almost all physical space consists of emptiness, as if it's a hologram. But the most incredible and beautiful experiment that caused people to doubt our reality's veracity is the double slit experiment. So imagine you're playing a video game in a vast open world. It can be one big city or an entire planet. In this world, many people walk, cars drive, birds fly, and animals run. This game requires a lot of computing power to work correctly. And to optimize this power, the game works so that you can see the entire developed world only when you look at it. For example, you ride a motorcycle in the game. You see an open world in front of you. But behind you, and in places where you are not staring, this world is not fully loaded. If you load the world as a whole, and all of its million details simultaneously, it requires much more power from the computer. So, the world is loaded only in places where you look at it. That's how games optimize power. Sometimes the image doesn't load immediately after you look at it. For example, you turn quickly and notice that the game map is smeared, but a second later it fully recovers. Thanks to the computer's weak power or a bad game engine, the information didn't have time to load. Or when you approach a large building from a distance, you first see the outline of that building, and as you get closer, you begin to distinguish more and more details. This leads us to the double slit experiment. Picture a tube that shoots tiny balls, particles of light, photons. There is a blackboard in front of you. You shoot a burst of photons at it and leave a trace of them on the board. 
Now, let's put a plate with a thin vertical slit in the middle between the board and you. You start shooting balls, and some of them pass through the slot on the plate. The particles that hit the backboard through this slit leave a smooth vertical trail. Now for the fun part. We can make another vertical slit in the plate. Now, when you shoot photons, two vertical trails should form on the board. But this doesn't happen. A lot of vertical tracks appear. When photons pass through the plate, they somehow strangely lose the property of a particle and acquire the property of a wave. And these waves hit the board and leave an unusual pattern in the form of several vertical stripes. It's as if the photons pass through 10 slits instead of two. Maybe when photons pass through two slits, they collide with each other, fly off in different directions, and form many vertical traces on the board. To check this, you shoot one at a time. It's strange, but even now, a wave mark forms on the board. It seems the particle is divided into two parts before passing through the slits. Then they knock against each other, split again, and leave a lot of vertical marks on the board. To understand how this happens, you carefully observe the photons before they fly through the slits. You place a measuring device close to the plate. You see how the photons fly to the plate, pass it, and there are no waves. When you watch the photons, they don't turn into a wave. But if you don't watch them, the photons leave a wave trail. Photons behave like waves when they're not observed, like a map in a video game looks blurry and not detailed. But as soon as you glance there, the map becomes clear. Photons, like this map, behave more logically when you look at them. Observation changes the reality around you. Just as a player's observation in the game makes the image more detailed, just like a simulation. There is no 100% proof that we live in a simulation, just that there is no proof that we live in a real world either. People feel what is happening to them and experience happiness, anger, pity, sadness, and only these things matter. Even if we live in a hologram that completely simulates reality, what's wrong with that? The difference between such a simulation and reality is impossible to feel. Oh, I think my head is going to explode. Which of these faces is real? You're at a TV show hosted by a robot, and that's the final question that can win you $1 million. You zoom in and zoom out on the pictures, shake your head, and pick up one of the four photos. You'll find out if that's the right choice a few minutes later. But first, the robot host tells you there's a legit way to tell a dummy, and the secret is in the eyes. If you zoom in on them, you'll notice the pupils of people who don't really exist look somewhat weird. Most of them aren't round, and they have to be near circular in real healthy adults. The researchers designed a tool to extract the outlines of pupils from photos and check if they're of elliptical shape. They tested it on 2,000 images, 50% of which were real faces, and the remaining 50% were artificially curated. Looks like the technology behind them still doesn't fully understand human eye anatomy. This flaw could help protect the world from malicious use of realistic-looking photos used to deceive and catfish people on social media platforms. Non-existent human photos were created using GANs, that's Generative Adversarial Networks. In 2014, AI researcher Dr. Ian Goodfellow decided to create a deep learning model that would be able to generate fake data. It would work using two neural networks competing against each other. The task of the first network would be to generate fake images using an existing data set. The task of the second network would be to see the difference between real and fake images. Both networks would learn from each other. The better the first one got at generating images, the better the second one would be at identifying those generated images from real ones. Dr. Goodfellow got that idea as he was out with friends. As soon as he arrived home, he wrote a code for it, and it worked out from the first attempt. There are many concerns about GANs spreading fake data across the world, but GANs can be used and useful for 3D object generation, creating cartoon characters, creating new human poses for online shopping websites, photo editing, converting photos to emojis, translating text to images, and many other similar functions. Technology is getting better and better at creating realistic human faces. It keeps learning from its own mistakes, 
so it's getting trickier and trickier to tell a fake from a real one. There's a function known as style transfer that lets the system process different fragments of the image separately. It means it can take a certain face shape and hairstyle and blend them together more realistically. But in case you have doubts someone's photo you see online is real, you can check it out for certain clues. GAN-generated photos, especially older ones, are sometimes slightly asymmetrical. The hair is fuzzy, just on one side, and an earring or some other accessories are just on one side. You could also notice disconnected strands of hair on the face or elsewhere, or get the feeling it was painted with one huge brush and acrylic paint. It just feels too straight, has a strange halo, or even a fluorescent bleed. It's also pretty tricky for the algorithms to create perfectly symmetrical and realistic-looking eyeglasses. There could be a mismatch in framing styles on the right and on the left side. The frame could also be crooked. The algorithms could also make a mistake in the number or orientation of teeth and draw on examples of teeth from different angles. There could be a tiny third middle tooth and other dental oddities. The background could also give away a fake image. It's also generated by the same technology, but without paying so much attention to it. It could consist of weird structures and patterns, like chaotic cubist forms, or look like a torn photograph. Sometimes you can tell something is just off with the clothes of your new online acquaintance. The face could be flawless, and so is the outfit. But a strange winter coat somehow doesn't match the tropical surroundings and shades. Older generation algorithms also left shiny blobs looking like water splotches that could appear in any part of the image, but mostly between the hair and the background. You can see tons of computer-generated portraits on special websites. There is also one for cats that don't exist, with thousands of unrealistic cat faces. Another website lets you look at photos of apartments that don't really exist. Neural networks are also capable of generating videos blending together the faces and bodies of different people. There's an algorithm that can guess new view angles from just one photo. They track landmark facial features such as eyes, nose, and lips, and generate new photos from one. They take the resulting multiple images and add them to a video. This way, we can see what Mona Lisa would look like in a video, moving around and looking realistic as ever. Many people have concerns about this sort of technology being used for mean purposes to create videos of people you want to throw some mud at. But the researchers see this technology applied to video conferencing, multiplayer games, and the special effects industry. Victor Ripperbelli, CEO and co-founder of Synthesia Software Company, believes it could take filmmaking to a new level. Computer-generated versions of actors can be so perfect, you wouldn't tell them from real humans. When they tested this technology, three to four minutes was enough to create a digital model of an actor talking into the camera. It remembers how the face moves and can recreate it. Back at the TV studio, the robot host says it's time to find out if you did win $1 million for telling the only picture of a real human out of three GANs generated images. And you were right. There's confetti all over the place and the surprise news. You get the bonus prize of spending one day with a lifelike robot. They're getting more and more realistic every day. They talk like us, walk like us, and even have a wide range of emotions. You're sure you can still tell the difference after one day. The first robot you get to choose from is the first Android newscaster that was presented to the world in Japan in 2014. She read a segment on live television and then retired to Tokyo's National Museum of Emerging Science and Innovation. There, she helps visitors and collects data for studies on human-robot interaction. Her younger sister Erica took a step up and got some real charisma from her creators. She's connected to a computer system constantly scanning the person. She picks up on the direction of the human face and the facial expression and can understand who the person is. She can have a proper conversation with humans on a variety of topics. Erica can move her facial features, her neck, shoulders, and waist independently. Erica was recently cast for a lead role in a sci-fi film. She got proper training for the part. Her creators had to simulate her motions and emotions through one-on-one -on -one sessions to teach her to control the speed of movements and develop her own character. 
Bina 48 is a Hansen Robotics humanoid robot modeled after the wife of one of her creators. They spent more than 100 hours compiling all of her memories, feelings, and beliefs. In 2017, Bina 48 became the first robot to ever enroll and successfully complete a college-level class in California. She has traveled the world, appearing on various TV shows. Sophia is probably the most famous project by Hansen Robotics and their most advanced human-like robot. She became the first robot to be given citizenship of a real country, Saudi Arabia. She is also the first robot innovation ambassador for the United Nations Development Program. She has a broad spectrum of emotions and can express them through her facial features and full-sized arms and hand gestures. She speaks at conferences around the world and is a real celebrity. And the final robot you get to choose from is Douglas, named the Autonomous Digital Human by its creators. He is being developed by Digital Domain, the company behind visual effects for some of the most famous movies. Douglas is supposed to break the barriers between humans and machines, talking easily and naturally, and switching faces like a chameleon. Douglas should be a great help for companies that need to answer customers' questions or assist them with repetitive tasks. You pick Douglas to help science test it and leave the studio with your new robot friend. Now, sure, science and technology will continue to evolve, but there are some inventions we just have to forget about. Not because we don't have the resources for them, but simply because they are physically impossible. On that note, let's talk about human teleportation, a cool concept you may have seen in the movies. Quantum teleportation has been demonstrated in labs, where scientists have managed to create a connection between entangled photons over long distances. But let's be real, it's a far cry from teleporting an entire human being. Plus, the teleportation in the Star Trek universe, for instance, involves something called destructive copying, which means the original person gets obliterated. Ouch! So even if teleportation were somehow possible, it would be basically like stepping into an annihilation machine. On top of that, the sheer physical and energy requirements for teleportation are mind-boggling. Just imagine a system that can instantly scan, record, and transmit every single bit of information that makes up a human body. And then, it has to compile that person at the destination without even slightly messing up a single molecule. It's a whole lot easier to send someone a PDF. So as much as teleportation sounds awesome, it's not something we can realistically achieve. The technology and energy needed for such a feat are way beyond our current capabilities. Maybe someday in the future, but for now, teleporting ourselves from one place to another remains firmly in the realm of science fiction. And so, mass transportation needn't be worried about becoming obsolete. Human teleportation isn't the only thing on our impossible things list. Let's dive into the concept of time travel, too. Thanks to the genius of Albert Einstein, we've come to realize that time travel is actually a thing. At least, technically. Einstein's theories propose the existence of these nifty things called wormholes, which could connect different parts of space and time. In other words, they might just be the key to creating a legit time machine. Now, here comes the tricky part. According to some super smart physicists, if we ever want to build a time machine, we'd have to figure out a way to harness the energy of an entire star or a massive black hole. And that's not all. There's an even bigger challenge. We'd also need to stabilize the wormhole and make sure that the entrance, or the place where we step into the wormhole, stays open for our return trip. Because, let's face it, nobody wants to go back in time only to find themselves stuck there forever. Unless you could buy Apple stock right at the beginning. <laughs> Imagine this, we've all seen those cool spaceships in movies that have these awesome protective layers, right? Well, it's not completely out of the question that someday, our spaceships could have a similar setup. They could be surrounded by a special layer made of charged plasma or a super strong electromagnetic force. Now here's where things get a bit tricky. When it comes to personal force fields, it's a whole different story. You see, a force field's main job is to either soak up or bounce back a whole lot of energy coming at it. In order to do that, it has to push out with an equal or even stronger force to stop the energy from getting through. 
Now, if we're talking about a force field just for one person, things get a bit more complicated. The only cosmic force that could potentially work for a personal force field is electromagnetism. But here's the thing. Electromagnetic force only works on charged objects. And guess what? Humans are electrically neutral, which means we don't have a charge to play with. So even if we somehow manage to create a gadget that could envelop a person in a mighty force field, there's no guarantee that the person inside wouldn't get zapped. Making the force field work in all directions would be a real challenge. So while it's a super cool idea to have our own personal force field, it's not as easy as it sounds. Physics and our electrically neutral bodies make it quite the uphill battle. Meanwhile, will we ever be able to upload our minds into supercomputers? Well, not really. Because here's the thing, we can't transfer our consciousness. Most methods of uploading focus on copying our brain's basic information onto a digital platform. But what happens to our consciousness when we're suddenly in two places at once? You end up with a bunch of identical copies of your mind, albeit digital, each one claiming to be the real deal. They're all equally genuine, too. As with human teleportation, does this mean the original will need to be destroyed? Hard to tell at this point. This conundrum is what the specialists call the continuity of consciousness problem, and is causing quite a stir in the philosophical, neuroscientific, and AI communities. Big topic at parties. The thing is, we're still in the dark about the nature of consciousness. We don't have a solid scientific explanation for it yet, so we're stuck in a guessing game. Even if we can't figure out the whole consciousness thing, the idea of uploading our minds is still pretty mind-blowing, though. Just imagine being able to exist in a digital realm, living out all sorts of wild experiences without the limitations of our physical bodies. It's like stepping into a whole new world, or through the looking glass. Of course, there are plenty of ethical considerations to ponder. What happens to our sense of self? Will we still feel like us in the digital realm? And what about the copies? Are they just as valid as the original? It's definitely a complex web of questions that might never have definitive answers. There are some things that will never happen, unfortunately, even when it comes to space travel. Sure, it can be a mind-boggling experience, especially when it comes to the whole idea of zero gravity. It's something that many people tend to overlook or misunderstand. The truth is, you can never fully escape the clutches of gravity, no matter where you are in the vast expanse of the universe. However, there's still a way to achieve that weightless sensation we often associate with being in space. Now, even in the depths of space, various gravitational forces are at play, exerted by celestial bodies like the moon, the sun, and the countless stars out there. But here's the thing. If you can match your acceleration with your surroundings, you can create the illusion of floating. This is precisely why astronauts undergo specific training. A unique aircraft takes a dive into freefall, giving them a taste of weightlessness for a brief period of time. Now picture this, being weightless, completely free from the pull of gravity. It's an experience like no other, and those who have had the pleasure describe it as utterly surreal. In a so-called zero-g environment, it's impossible to distinguish between floating and actually plummeting towards the Earth when you close your eyes. That's why aircraft training plays a crucial role in preparing astronauts for the real deal. Now, don't get me wrong, I totally appreciate all the theories about space colonization. But let's get real here. We're not going to be cruising through space on a gigantic interstellar vessel anytime soon. You know those generation ships they talk about? Well, it's a pretty cool concept. But let's break it down in a more down-to-earth way. The idea behind these generation ships is to create a self-sustaining miniature version of Earth that can support a group of brave space explorers on their long journey to another solar system. Here's the catch, though. The distances between solar systems are mind-bogglingly vast, and that poses a major challenge. We're talking about some serious logistical problems when it comes to resources and materials on a ship that has to sustain an entire colony. We obviously can't afford to be wasteful on a mission like that. That's where the concept of suspended animation swoops in. What this means is that we'll have to freeze everyone up for the journey. Just until they reach the desired destination, of course. 
This also covers the problem of raising a family on a starship. The odds of someone agreeing to spend generations upon generations hurtling through space are pretty low. However, even if suspended animation sounds like a better solution, we are still far from figuring out how to maintain people in that state for longer periods of time. For the time being, tests have only shown this might work for mere minutes.